okay, so we the agenda for tonight, we have two excellent talks on related to testing. So I'm very excited. It's kind of the night of testing. We are going to start with Q. And Q, I'm going to let you choose if you want to say your full name or not, but I'm going to go with Q because that's what that's what you put on Twitter and everywhere. So <laughs> Q is our first speaker. I will have Oh, you know what? Jason was going to, Jason had a little bit of an emergency. So let me actually, uh, Marcus, do you want to do that? Or do you want me to introduce him? Oh, please go ahead. Okay. Okay. Let me pull that up. So yeah, we'll start with Q. He's going to go through his talk. And then we have two really fun segments planned, just short, shorter segments. That's where we will in, uh, kind of do a little interview or fireside chat. I like to call them with column uh, and it will be partially about his book that he's just put out but more than that as well so i'm excited to have that discussion with him and then alisa and it's actually going to be chris tonight we had a we had a little bit of uh our our meetup organizers have all sorts of we've got a sick a sick person and um another one dealing with some injuries and so we're a little bit beaten up and and battered tonight but chris is going to step in for Preston and Chris and Elisa and I are going to be doing a preview for NG Conf, which I'm really, really excited about. So that'll be a fun little segment. And then to wrap it all up, Elisa is going to give her talk. And from there, we'll we'll get into prizes and job sharing. But that's kind of the overview of tonight. So Q, let me let me pull these up and let's get into this. Everybody else. Um, I think we can turn off our cameras at this point and kind of get ready for the rest of the presentations. But Q, how are you? I know you were you and I were kind of chatting earlier, but do you want to tell everybody a little bit about where you're, like, what city you're in, where you live, and all of that? Yeah, I'm Q. You said like I have a <laughs> another name, Quantarius, that I typically don't go by. That a lot of people know me as that too, but I've gone by Q for a long time now. Um, I am in the Northwest Arkansas area, um, home of the smaller big tech. Uh, that's where Walmart, Tyson, JB Hunt, Simmons, all those companies are kind of right here at the, the Northwest corner of Arkansas. Uh, I am a, technically I'm an architect for, on a product in JB Hunt. Um, we call ourselves expert software engineers, <laughs> so, <laughs> but that's our title. We have a fancy title. Um, I'm also a Cypress ambassador. Uh, so kind of akin to um, to Jordan Powell, who was just on here, who is he works for. The, he's a, a developer experience guy. But um, yeah, I, I'm really good friends with him and um, those guys over there. So uh, testing, especially with Cypress, is one of my big hobbies, as has been since 2018. And, it, and fun fact about myself, you can see in the background, there's a shelf of board games. Um, I'm sitting at close to 300 now, um, oh, 300, wow. 300 boxes, I wouldn't say 300 games, but there's a lot of expansions in there. Um, yeah, that's my, my main hobby. That So you need to talk with Joe Eames, because I think he could give you a run for your money on how many games he has. Apparently, I'm still a novice. There's guys here who have well over 500, 600 games. I'm, oh, I'm, the, I'm the newbie of the group. So, Do you have a favorite then? Is there one that maybe maybe just a current favorite because i know that's hard especially when yeah. you have that many yeah i think my favorite board game period is probably spirit island it's a four to i think they think the expansion you can do five player uh cooperative game where you're pretty much fighting off settlers and your spirits uh you have like um islanders who worship you and the more uh the more the more time goes on you have to fight off more invaders who are trying to settle your island essentially and it's it's, okay. it's a fun game um but i i just got frost haven in not too long ago and uh, people may know what gloomhaven is frost haven is the the successor to it it's uh the the second part of that and that one's pretty awesome i think gloomhaven was the number one game on bgg for what five five years or so now i just dropped to number three uh okay. but i think frost haven will be there pretty soon Awesome. I did not know this about you. So you're quite the, the gamer. I love it. Yeah, that's fun. So all right, then on the more technical side of things, 
I see you everywhere. I, I keep seeing like, oh, now Q is doing a podcast episode with these guys and now he's over here and now he's writing an article <laughs> for NG champions and he's giving a talk over here, you know, like all over. So do you have any suggestions for how, how other developers can get more active in the Angular community? Well, I would say if, if you're not like, um, like those guys who are contributing to open source all the time, who's getting their names out there. I think the next best way is to just spend time outside of work and writing something. Uh, Preston actually told me like he, he would write articles for things he got stuck on and then he would write an article about it. And a couple months later, he'd come back and find that same article. Um, I, I, I didn't want to go that way. I, I wanted to go from a enterprise experience. Uh, perspective we we read a bunch of articles about things that hey you can just do these things here and it just works and it's like well we're not confined or we're confined to different standards than just um open source or pet projects there's a lot more red tape you have to go through so i wanted to start writing articles um that could kind of come at it from that point of view um but you know any other suggestion i would just say just kind of get out there start communicating on twitter or um, get your name out there on LinkedIn, tagging Angular. Uh, NG Conf is where I kind of got started with the whole thing, talking to people there. Uh, I know that that's kind of um, the standard answer is like, just go socialize. I'm not very social, <laughs> believe it or not, but um, it's it's so easy. Everybody's so friendly and it's really easy to just get out there and start just putting yourself out there. Definitely, yeah. Okay, well, great suggestions, great advice. And I think you should bring some games with you to ng-conf and we'll just have to sit down and get a group of us together and play them. Yeah, for sure. Let's do it. Okay. All right. Sounds good. But all right. On to your talk. So you're here <laughs> to, your your talk is officially titled Cypress Component Testing with Angular Standalone Components. And with that, I think I'll just turn it over to you. I know we're all eager to, to hear what you have to share. Yeah. I mean, I, I always give myself really long titles and then I don't go with them. I don't know if that's just a thing that um, <laughs> that everybody does or not, but I, I think I don't think I've ever had the same title as when I went in. But I wanted to go into something that's a little more melody because I, I, it was just right there in front of me, standalone components and then component testing, just kind of combine the two together and kind of go from there. Um, let's see. So, um, I did. I did just do this talk. You talked about me doing these podcasts and stuff, and I did just did. I just did one called uh, "Make Angular Testing Great Again," and that was on Angular Air. Um, and that one, though, I went into a really big comparison, mostly on the differences between the different types of testing. I also wrote an article about that because component testing, I felt, was a pretty untapped space. Everyone does unit testing. Everyone does end-to-end -end testing, but there's that middle ground that was kind of untapped. And um, Cypress gave you a really good way to do it before with, when it first came out in 2018. You can kind of do workflows without going through Protractor. Um, and then as of Cypress um, 12, um, we can actually do component testing at a much, a much um, more precise level, I guess, a smaller, smaller units of code. So you're almost getting in a unit testing, but it's more component testing. Um, like I said, Jordan just did this, but um, I feel like I have to ask myself who needs to hear it again. And I mean, literally everyone needs to know about testing and I don't mind getting on the mountains and yelling it down to everyone if they, even if they don't want to hear it. But I think it's, I think it's a, a pretty fun talk always to just talk about testing. And I'm glad you guys are doing a, a night test or a, a night of testing. Um, so um, we want to get into um, how the testing and the standalone components kind of mix in together because you could do component testing without standalone testing or without standalone components. And back when I started my career, back in the early 2010s, 2010-ish, 2012, um, there was a, a new craze that came about. Um, I don't know if it was that popular, but, but it, did, it did make the waves a little bit. And it was called Atomic CSS. And Atomic CSS was this methodology created by uh, Thierry uh, Koblenz, I think is his name. He's French, and I don't I don't have a good French pronunciation, but 
Um, he he talked about creating these small bits of classes that would eventually build out and to make these bigger classes. Uh, it was different than the standard just throw CSS rules inside of your style sheets and just make it work. We we had the concept of cascading style sheets. They just worked. Uh, if something ended up conflicting with one another, you could just throw an, an important on there and it would it would fix it. Um, not too long later, I would say four or five years later, uh, Brad Frost came up with this um, this methodology based on that same concept called atomic design, um, where we have atoms, molecules, organisms, templates, and pages. And these things are essentially called the five basic building blocks of web design. And if you follow these, this guideline of atoms for, let's say we have a button or an input, and when I combine multiple atoms together, you get molecules uh, like an input field. It has a label and input and a button. I click search, it does its thing. An organism may be a group of those different things together. So in a nav, so in a nav bar, I might want to search for a user at the top to select that user or something. Uh, and then a template would be the entire content of a page. Uh, and that would be multiple organisms together. Um, oftentimes, though, that doesn't typically work, especially in enterprise. Um, we generally, I mean, I guess my company does have a design system, but it is based on PrimeNG. A lot of people or a lot of companies will import um, like a Prime or a Kindo material um, and something like that that has a component library. So we, we don't get to start out by testing at that super granular level. We probably get to start on something like molecules or, um, or organisms, probably more likely. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's not really a failure, um, but it, it does kind of change the scope of how I should be designing my components. And you get into the habit of just, hey, I'm just going to throw all of my logic, all of my templating in one component file. Maybe not just one, but maybe you have several big component files. Uh, modules are kind of the the antithesis to this design. I, I wouldn't say that it's necessarily a bad thing, but um, it did make developers feel exceptionally comfortable to just throw several components, pipes, directives, services, all, all in one module together, um, and which eventually caused bloat. For example, you have a user module that's going to house all of my user-based logic and components. So I have a user module that has a user page, and then I have a user details page, and then I have a user management page, and then I have a user list, et cetera, et cetera. All those things are going to be declared inside of a module. And, and I think it made it very comfortable because at the at the time, I don't think scams had became very popular, which were single components and modules. It was more, if I have to declare a module, in a, or if I have to declare a component in a module, I might as well just throw as many um, components as I need to in, in one module. Uh, we also get the concept of pipe modules or directive modules where we just throw all of our pipes in a single shared pipe module and then just export the entire thing to another module somewhere else. Uh, luckily, standalone components comes out and now we don't have to bloat a particular module. I mean, we can now just bloat a component, but but the, the deal is now we can see that we probably don't need so many imports if if or so many our imports and exports from one module we can just throw what we need specifically in a particular component um that being said just because angular is providing us with the feature doesn't mean that we're doing things correctly we can still turn on the standalone component flag to true and still just throw 200 lines of 200 lines of uh, code or templating and styles in a single component, uh, which kind of the meme I made here. Uh, just because something's there doesn't mean you're using it correctly or using it at all. We just turn the feature on and continue doing things the way we're we're doing it before. That being said, everyone always agrees on two basic tenets of development. And if we were in a group, I would just kind of ask what those two things are. And I'm sure most people will say that. Um, everything should be tested always, and business logic should always live in services. I hear that often, and funny enough, if I follow up with that and say, so all your code is tested or all your business logic lives in services, 
I normally get a pushback saying, no, we don't test everything because the business doesn't support testing or no, I, we have logic all over the place. I have 500 lines of code in my component. But if that's the case, then how do you handle business logic and how do you test everything? When, business, when I say business logic, I mostly mean HTTP requests, Obviously, those things are probably going to live in the service, manipulating that data that comes back from it, and then most CRUD operation that you're going to use in your front end. And then when I say test everything, I typically mean the TS files, um, because whenever you do use the CLI, you do get specs for whatever you're creating. So if I get if I'm creating a component, I get a component.spec file. If I create a pipe, I get a pipe.spec file. Um, and I've heard people say that they just delete those right after the right after the fact because they don't want to test it. They can just manually test it. So if everything should move out of components and you should have these clean, empty components, then it should be you should need to test them, right? Um, then I get the pushback of what about component logic? But if I have something very specific to a component, let's say I have a panel component, and then that panel I can have a divider or something that can show, or a a panel filter of some sort that can that just just some type of component specific logic that has nothing to do with business logic. What do I do about that stuff? And generally, I just say you know we have pipes and directives. We don't need to have any type of type scripting inside of our components at all. Or for components are meant to be behaviors that are used by um, our end users, then why should we need to put the code there if we have these other means of ways to store and call those things from our component? So if that's the case, then shouldn't we just delete the component.spec file? Um, and I would say if you just have the component spec file, sure. You could though, and I think Alyssa is going to talk about this in just a second with her um, test harnessing. You can still use these. Um, but in my case, I, I, I feel like the component.spec file should not be needed anymore because I, I do have component testing now via Cypress. And the other demo I talked about, you can still see like how we could still use the um the Jasmine and Karma to still do component testing by using a fixture and grabbing that data um, and manipulating it that way with testbed. Um, but I, I feel like component testing via Cypress does it a lot easier. I can still use my tests for or my spec files for um, pure functional unit tests with pipes and directives in my services if I absolutely need to. Um, but for components specifically, I only want to test the behaviors and how an end user is going to interact with them. And so I do have a small demo of this application that I was working on. I've been working on it for a long time, and I just haven't finished it still to this day. But for the for the most part, I can kind of get by with it. Let's see. We'll start over. So this is this weird Star Wars thing that I'm using the Swapy API for. Um, I, I want to just use it as an example to um, show some accessibility, um, social animation, and to use it as a harness for component testing. There's a couple things in there, though, that don't work too well uh, with the component testing because I created this animation that does a card flip over, um, and on the back side, it gives you some information, small amount of information, the gender, birth year, height, weight, eye color. Um, and if I click on this, it takes me to a page that gives a little bit more, some of the same information, but a little bit more information. Uh, eventually, I'll fill it out with some movie stuff. But for now, it's very bare bones. Um, you can also search for something. Like I can search for Darth. I can get back a couple of characters back. I get Darth Vader, Darth Maul. Uh, when I click reset, it gets all of that. So I wanted to just create a couple of tests, mainly component tests, to just kind of show how you can break these things out in smaller pieces. Um, I don't need to bloat my components with a, a bunch of logic that I can't test easily. I mean, I guess I could test it easily still, but in, in this case, I feel like Angular gives us the right tools to do some of these things a little, um, a little easier to test. And like I said before, you have... You still have your pipe, still have your directives. I don't have any, oh, I do have a directive in here, maybe. Oh, I do actually. Um, but yeah, I have my pipes for, for data manipulation or for view manipulation. So in this case, let's look at some of the data I get back. If you look at a character, 
a character is going to look like this. I'm going to get a name, height, mass, hair color, some of the stuff that you see in, in the in the fields there. Um, but one thing important is that the data does come back kind of weird. So I get the name, I get a height that just has a number. It's a string, though. Um, the mass is also a string. And if you look closely, that's all going to be metric um, and not in the great imperial. Um, and then there are some things here that aren't capitalized that I'd probably want to be capitalized just for consistency. So I would create pipes for all these instead of trying to convert these things on the fly. Generally, what you would see, maybe not in good code bases, but in code bases that I've worked in, I've seen a lot of things like I'm going to use um, some RxJS to grab this height value, and then I'll do some map on this and change the value to a, um, a more readable for us Americans value. Um, and over here, back over here again, you can kind of see here that generally speaking, if or if we didn't want to use a pipe, we could use a function inside of this. I don't think anybody would do that, but you could do that. Instead, I'm going to use a pipe for every single one of these values just to kind of clean up my my template a little bit. Can and for you? each, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, can you actually increase your font size a little bit? Oh, more, huh? Yeah, yeah, perfect, thank you. Yeah, no problem. So here before, like I said, I have, I'm getting Luke Skywalker back. I'm getting his gender back. But the most important parts here are this height and mass because those things are going to come back in, in metric. I don't want to see it in metric. Or maybe I do want to keep it metric, but I do want to stylize it a little bit more because right now it's just a number. So as you can see here, I have this tr pipe transform here. Uh, it's just the basic transform I'm going to to uh, multiply it by this converter here, and then I want to return it back in the regular value that I got back with the centimeters on the end there, and then I'm going to put it into some imperial for us American folks. I don't want to get rid of unit testing entirely in my repo, um, so what I'll do is I'll create some pure functional tests um, that are just going to be what you would normally unit test. I feel like if I'm going to unit test something, uh, I want it to be a pure function. So I want to just always do something in line. I don't want to do the act arrange and assert. I just want to pop a value in there and then expect whatever I'm going to get on the other side to be what I expect. So for each of these, I should it should be very simple to just, I pass in an empty string, I get back an empty string. I pass in 112, I get 112 centimeters and three feet, eight inches. I pass back the small number. Does it actually do what I want it to do? In this case, it does. I get zero feet, zero inches. I can do that for all of my pipes. That way, I don't have to expect to test all those scenarios in a component test. But when I get to a component test, what I want to do is specifically test that all of my functionality does work exactly how I would expect it to. And so if you've used Cypress in the past for integration testing or end-to-end -end testing, it's going to look the exact same, the exact same format. I'm still going to do a side.get to get this data side tag, which is just an attribute that I added onto that um, that data, that description prop or the description tag that I, in my template. Um, and I'm going to do just does it have the text and is it formatted the way that I would expect it to be when it goes through that pipe? So you can see Luke Skywalker, he's a male, 19 dby. I'm going to expect that that 172 is going to equal five foot eight. I'm going to expect that um, the 77 is going to come back at 77 kilograms with 169.8 pounds. And then I'm going to expect that my capital, uh, my blue is capitalized. Um, you can actually see these tests run just like normal. This, the component test is still just like the typical end to end suite from, um, from Cypress. This was character profile. So if I want to run these tests here, <clears throat> it does exactly what we would expect. Each of these get iterated over and they do show exactly how I would want them to show up. They are converted and they do pass. Um, there are some cool caveats to this too. Um, I know that Preston had asked a question in Twitter not too long ago about um, 
mocking some services. Not everyone's going to be able to have clean components that don't have any type of logic inside of them for most of the most of the time. So if you're going to want to use component testing, you're probably still going to want to deal with services that are being used by that component. I have another project that has that in it. Maybe, maybe. I thought I did somewhere. Let's see if I can pull it up. Yeah, here we go. I was working on this one for us, but I couldn't get one test to work, so I felt bad about it. But if you want to still do providers, it still has the exact same syntax that used to, or that we could use in Jasmine and Karma and Jest, um, where I still do a provide on the service that I want to provide and a use value, this mock value that I have. So I have a store here just a service. I'm going to new it up and then I'm going to be able to spy on any of the tasks just like I would do any other spy. And so here I have this store here that has add task on it. I can still do an alias. So just like a, a, um, a spy alias name. And then when I run the tests, it can still do the same stubbing as a unit test. So as you can see here, when I do this should allow a user to create a task and save it to the store. Um, I can get this new task. I can still name it whatever I want to here. I'm going to type in this as a test. I'll click on the add task button and this add task alias here, which is what I named this particular function up here, this add task function can now be subscribed to and not subscribed to, but can be spied and called on just like a normal unit test spy. So should have been called with. This is a test and there you have it. So you can still do a lot of things that you would normally do with a unit test and a component test, but now you can actually test the HTML and your CSS as opposed to just worrying about testing only the functional pieces of your code and leave that to being tested by your directives, pipes and services. I don't wanna keep you guys too long. So that was it, I tried to keep it right under 20 minutes. Um, I don't know if we do questions or not right here or not, but that's my presentation. Yeah, thank you so much. That was great. Yeah, awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, definitely. Let's do some questions. Um, let's check it out. We will start with the Q and A section here. Okay. So we got a question from Akila. Akila, great to have you back. Uh, let's see. I heard once that testing is only realistic if you have a project that has detailed specification otherwise it takes up a lot of time what are your thoughts as a junior dev what sort of exercise can you do to learn testing an input yeah i, I think uh i don't want to say it's a silly thought <laughs> but any any code that you're writing if you want to always have 100 certainty that that code is going to always work and i mean i, I can't always say always but if you if you want to have a peace of mind in your code, um, especially if you're giving it to someone else, it's always a good idea to test it because you never know what could go wrong with the code. There's always an edge case. There's always something hiding in the darkness ready to embarrass you in the future. Uh, there would be demos way back when where we go in. We didn't we didn't test back in 2012. It was a kind of a foreign concept to us, but we would manually test the heck out of our code and then we go into demos and they tell you to do something and you do it and it just blows up in your face you just never know when it's going to happen and so i always say the more test the merrier I, I, you can test it in, in, in many different ways you have unit tests you have component tests um you have end-to-end -end tests to also do things that you would normally do with regression um and just have fun with it i think i think that any type of testing is a little more fun to me than just trying to write a feature because those things can give you a little more challenging take on the code than um than just writing it you know we have another question from anna boca who was asking about um ways about getting buy-in from like your manager or other engineers that you're working with because a lot of times you're under the gun to like just ship the code don't worry about the test just get it done um so what are your thoughts on on trying to change that environment to be more pro testing yeah, I hear that's a common problem. I think you just have to do it. I've, I've done that before at a startup that I worked at. And it was, hey, we don't have time to worry about testing. If it's broken, we'll just fix it later. 
And it's like, nah, <laughs> I don't want to do the same thing twice. But when, when I'm done, when I finish my project, I'll be done with it. And so um, you just got to just cheat it in. Um, and it, it also gives you a good opportunity to learn other things as well. Before that, I didn't know much about Docker or Kubernetes but I had to build my own pipeline to make it work. And I had to learn a little bit about CICD because they didn't want to spend time on it. So it, it's always a good learning opportunity for yourself. And there's no better investment than the investment in time of yourself. So I think it's always awesome. Awesome. Uh, and spe speaking of uh, CI, uh, we got a question here. Have you noticed any degradation in CI time due to Cypress? needing to install plus verify the Cypress bin, then build an Angular app to host and serve the components for testing? We did um, for a while, but you could actually get around a lot of that. We have, um, <laughs> I, I saw a funny meme about ADO. We have, it, we have Azure <laughs> at our company. And um, we, talked, we talked a lot about like, hey, it takes a long time for the Cypress to install is, is adding an extra two or three minutes just to install and, and verify Cypress. Cypress has gotten a lot faster at that now in the in 12 plus, um, but it still adds time. But if you have dynamic agents, and I don't know what all CI CD pipelines have it, but if you have a dynamic agent that can be spun up as part of your build step, you can actually have them pre-installed with Cypress ahead of time. And so it cuts off a little bit of that time. Um, the other thing is, I'm going to sound like a salesman here, but we you, we use the Cypress Cloud, and you can run your tests in parallel. You, there's also Sorry Cypress that does it if you have the internal infrastructure to do it, uh, that lets you have parallelization. But we cut down, we were running about 500 tests, integration tests, as part of our PR. So every time a PR came in, one of our 30 devs would run this test thing suite that would take over an hour and a half. We were like, we got to do something different about this. And so we did, we turned on parallelization. We spin up 10 of those dynamic agents and our PR process takes about 15 minutes total. So we have that early catching that I feel is a, a lot better to catch those things with that, you know, 15 minute build rather than catching things in test or prod. So it, it's, I think it's a, a win there. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, there's actually several other questions in the Q and A section. If you want to answer those through uh, through the chat, yeah, sure. Um, but I think we need to uh, move on to the next uh, section. But thank you so much. That was awesome. A very important. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you so much, Q. And thank you to Marcus and and Chris for helping that uh, with that. But yeah, Colum, are you ready to? talk about your book yeah i'm here <laughs> perfect okay well everybody call him call him ferry i should say his last name too he's coming from ireland so like marcus it's very late for him so we're grateful that he's here at such a, a late or i guess early hour in his case but uh one thing that i have really just admired about you call him is that not only are you on the NX team, you're, you know, very dedicated, skilled developer, but then you've also set aside time to accomplish a lifetime goal of yours. And that's why we have you here tonight is to talk about this achievement that I think is so worth bringing to attention and um, celebrating. So Marcus mentioned it, you just recently published a new book. It's called The Blackstone Legacy. And everybody, it's available on Amazon, but we are going to go over that here in just a minute. But Colin, do you want to just give an overview of what, you know, what is the storyline? How did you come up with the the plot? What was kind of the inspiration behind it all? Yeah, sure. So this, the story sort of starts off about uh, explain the conflict between a mage guild, which has been around for years and sort of governs the local vicinity, and a race of goblins who are seen as the bad guys. They're out in the outcast and they're always causing conflict with the, the mage guild. They get in the battles on the outskirts of the villages and on the edge of the town. And it progresses from there to a student. So you're following a student who's at the mage guild who's going through his training 
and he gets get sent off in his graduation challenge. And as part of his graduation challenge, he needs to investigate a dragon attack in a local village. And from there, the plot continues to thicken into more, okay, is there something going on with the Mage Guild? Is the Mage Guild, why is the Mage Guild not helped out the people that have been attacked by the, the dragon? Why is a, a mage who's going through his graduation challenge being sent out to deal with this when it's like such a serious issue? And then that leads them to finding out more about where the dragon's located, and it's located at the same stronghold as the goblins. Mm -hmm. So now, is there a goblin involvement in this? And is, is there a way of of, of uh, attacking back at the mage guild and the, the local vicinity? And I won't give too much more away, but it sort of <laughs> progresses from there. Then I think it sounds exciting. I haven't had a chance to read it yet, but it's definitely on my like the top of my list. I love a good fantasy story. I know a lot of a lot of developers do, and also, I, I will say, and here's kind of a, a shameless plug, because you were recently just on a podcast with myself and with Preston. Uh, we're about to launch a new segment, everybody, of the um, Angular Plus show. So what um, Laura Newsom and Brian Love are doing over with the Angular Plus show, we're about to have a new segment of that come out called The Dev Life. And it will be more community focused. We're actually going to be taking some episodes or, or segments rather from the meetup here. That, that'll be about half of our episodes. But the other half will be interviews like we did with Colum. And he's going to be our first ever, we're so excited, our first episode. So that'll be fun. But it is very much about his journey and his experience as an author on top of being a full-time developer with Narwhal with NX. So it's very worth the listen uh, that will actually drop this Friday. So keep your eye out on the Angular Plus show, uh, like their stream, the podcast. You'll get more details there. But I like this idea of conflict. And oh, and one other thing I should mention to everybody before we move on, because the book is exciting and I really want to help call them to, to celebrate that. Like I said, it's a big achievement. And I mentioned that STG, one of our sponsors, is helping to give out three books. So stick around because later tonight we will have three of those books being given away and it'll be so fun. I'm I'm eager to get their feedback. I'm sure they're all going to love love the story. Um, and then one more question I have about <laughs> it, too, is isn't there isn't there at least one other book or is this a trilogy? So this book is a standalone book, but okay. it inspired me to start writing a trilogy. So okay. I'm now working on another book. Oh, wow. So a totally separate story then. Uh, yeah. Wow. Okay. Definitely. I'm going to, I'm going to be like Column's biggest fan over here, I think, <laughs> but all right. So yeah, like I said, like, I want to, I want to dig into this idea because what you said exactly was so much of the story is this theme of conflict, right? You have the the you said the mat the mage guild is that what they're called the mage guild yeah the mage guild okay sorry the mage guild and then the goblins and there's this conflict but when i was thinking about sitting down and and talking with colm a little bit more i thought you know that's actually an interesting topic let's dig into that though but from a developer's perspective and we think of conflict that we have you know what do we do when we have conflict at work is that you know Certainly, I think everybody's come across it at one point or another, but have you had any situations? And of course, we don't want to give way specific names or anything, but have you had situations that you've had to deal with conflict as a developer on the job? Yeah, the one that always sticks out in my mind is back when I was a junior developer. I was working at a company and part of like I had some financial difficulties and things like that. So part of my contract was that I could work remote. So I didn't have to come under the office because just it was financially unviable for me to travel because it would have been a two-hour commute and it was just difficult, especially with the two kids at home. So I was working remote, but the rest of the team was actually working in the office at the time. And it was rolling around the deadline time and the pressures were heaping up and the stress was get sort of getting to everybody at that stage. But the team and the office had started to have ad hoc meetings. So just in-person meetings with each other to make decisions about the direction that we were going to try and meet the deadlines. But that information, those decisions was ne were never getting propagated to me then while I was working from the house. So that's sort of creating a conflict because I was trying to do work and getting pushed back on it quite a lot. 
because I wasn't around or aware of the decisions that had been made regarding the work that I was expected to work on. So it kind of created this divide in the team where there was everyone in the office and they were the team. And then I was just on the outside, basically slowing things down by not knowing how to get things done the way it was expected. And that caused a serious divide in the company. Like uh, a lot of ill feelings in the team. Oh, sorry. I was waiting. Um, definitely. I think when, you know, when I think about conflict that I've seen in the office, I think a lot of times it just comes down to the communication, right? And it's either a lack of communication or miscommunications. But for me, when I really reflect back on the, the times that I've had when I've had the most conflict, I'd have to say too, though, that most of the time it's usually not vindictive or people aren't trying, they're not out to get you by any means. It's just a simple matter of, you know, gee, I could have simply just asked for more clarification or like in that case, like, do you, what, what do you think would have helped smooth over that situation for you where you were kind of isolated over there being remote? What do you think they could have done to help smooth that situation over? I think the easiest way is like you say, it's all down to communication. Like they're having it in ad hoc meetings, but we all still use Slack. We all still had Zoom. Like all it would have taken was somebody to just send me a link to a Zoom call and I could have participated in that yeah. ad hoc meeting. Like it's just a laptop on a desk. And that way then everybody is involved. Like something so simple can really help prevent that kind of uh, isolation and that kind of feeling towards all our developers within the team. So when we think about like prevention, then what ideas do you have for preventing conflict at work? So for me, it comes down to like, if you're, if everybody's humble, everyone on your team is humble and there's no egos that get involved or get in the way of things, then that helps because it then opens up a like step two of the plan, which is to be open and honest with your teammates. If you are struggling with something, it, you should be able to come to your colleagues and just say, look, I need help with this or I didn't understand that this was the way to do it. Can I get some more information? And that should be the, an open conversation. You should never feel afraid to sort of make that, uh, to have those conversations with your colleagues. And that is only formed when you've got like a, a very good environment of trust within your, within your team. And that all starts with everybody just being open and accepting of each other. So anybody on the team that has got a big ego or has taken anything for granted from all our team members, then that just breaks that into that whole like, culture of trust within the team. And then it just sort of makes people feel like, oh, I can't come to them and I'd say I'm struggling because they're going to look down on me for it. They're going to say things that I'm not going to appreciate and think, or like just creates this environment where you don't feel able to come to your colleagues just to ask for that help, Definitely. which can then cause that resentment, and which generally progresses under the conflict. Yeah, oh, I, I can't agree with that more. I think having a safe work environment where you feel like you can be open and say things, you know, even if it's just to a manager, it doesn't have to be to everybody, but being able to have that open conversation and be safe, I think is really important. Um, what are some things that you feel like Narwhal has done to really establish that kind of environment? So other teams and other companies can be working towards that as well. How can everybody create that kind of safe environment where the ego doesn't take over. So one thing I really loved about Narwhal ever since I joined is that it is a totally remote company. So they, they embrace like async communication and remote uh, practices like Zoom calls and Slack and things like that right from the get-go. And it's just ingrained in the culture that if you need anything from anybody, you can just message them on Slack. So like it's just this the culture shift of just being available to your colleagues to be able to talk to them and expecting the same coming in the opposite direction that they can come and talk to you if they need it. And a lot of it comes down to like a lot of the employees in our role are just great human beings as well. Like they're just like, they've got those morals, those ethics about them that just make them really good human beings beyond the developer side of it. Right. Yeah, that's true. Just remembering that we are human and not, yeah. not nine to five developers, but we are human beings one thing too that I've found is that it's always best just to apologize. Like 
get rid of that ego. Even if, yeah. even if you feel so strongly that it wasn't your fault, it's always a two way road. And I feel like just apologizing and kind of bowing down a little bit. That doesn't mean that you have to, you know, let people get away with things that truly were wrong, but I still think that it helps to apologize for your part in it. And that always seems to bring down the temperature and the heat in those conversations. And then all of a sudden the other person is more willing to communicate as well. So that's just a, a tip I've kind of picked up, you know, along the way, just like you said, get rid of the ego, apologize when you can. And I think communication opens up at that point. Yeah. I think that's a, it's a tip I learned a few years back where we missed a deadline. It wasn't Narwhal. It was a different company. We had missed a deadline and we had to go to the stakeholders and tell them that we'd missed that deadline. And mm -hmm. before the call, I had a, uh, a call with a not with the, the architect that was managing the project. And he said to me, we're going to undo this and I'm going to apologize. It's going to be the first thing I'm going to say. I'm going to say, sorry, we missed the deadline. And he said, it will disarm them because they were coming at us with some aggressive messages on Slack through emails that we'd missed it. He said, I'm going to go on and apologize. It's going to be the first thing I say. And it, I can promise you that it will disarm them and we will get an extension on the deadline. Yeah. And it did. It worked. It's exactly what happened. It just lowered the temperature of everything that was happening. And it just worked out so well for everybody involved. Isn't that one of the pragmatic programmers and uh, suggestions too, where he says, yep. just uh, don't make excuses, come up with solutions. And I think yeah. it does, it, it helps calm things down, but cool. Well, do you have any final thoughts you want to share about the, this topic of conflict at work? Yeah. So I was kind of thinking about things, like if you are in a situation where you're encountering conflict, like I kind of have three steps that I use to approach that. The first one would be to, if it's happened, if it's a one-off, it's happened once, then you could potentially just ignore it because there's likely external factors from the other person's perspective. Like they could have some sort of personal life stress, stress from other managers or from any of the other things that projects that they're working on. So it could just be an off day for them. If it continues to happen, I think the next step then is to approach them, but do it, like you say, in a very calm manner, just try to have a chat a conversation work out any differences and see if that helps the situation and from there step three would be to get somebody else an outsider to mediate on it and have a fresh set of eyes and like a fresh perspective on the situation yeah definitely totally agree and thank you thank you for your thoughts i know it's not an easy topic to to talk about sometimes it can get uncomfortable but thank you i think that was really good advice so I appreciate it. But everybody, again, his book is called The Blackstone Legacy. We will definitely be giving out those books here at the end. So please stay and um, congratulate him too, everybody. This is, it, it's such a, I feel like an achievement to set aside the time to really accomplish your goals outside of your job. And I would love if we can all just celebrate our achievements together. So yeah, but okay, moving on. We have our next segment, Alisa and Chris. Do you guys want to come on? We're going to do a little segment, everybody, called NG Comp and Me. And it is exactly that. This is all about NG Comp and uh, what you can expect, what we can look forward to. I have some news items we're going to go over. But more than that is a sneak peek. We're going to do a preview and just get excited. NGConf is so much fun. The, even when it was online, you know, and, and that's something I want to share a little bit with you tonight as well, is that there is this online option. NGConf has, as we all know, it was all only in person before COVID. And then it went only online for COVID for a couple of years. And then it went back to mostly in person with a little bit online this last time and now they've just fully embraced the the duality of it we're going to have ngconf in its awesomeness the june uh, 14th and 15th but then they are also developing a really fantastic online option 
And boy, do I wish I could do both because the things I'm hearing and the stuff that I know that they have planned is going to be, it, it really is going to, I think, flip our idea of what online conferences are. So really exciting news. I can't say too much. I know they want to, to uh, share that information a little bit further down the road, but Chris and Elisa, are you guys excited? It's coming up fast. Oh yeah, <laughs> very excited. Yes, so much, so much excited. And also, oh no, it's coming up so fast. I know, <laughs> right? <laughs> well, and that's, uh, yeah, let's talk about that because you both have talks. And Chris, this is this is kind of a, a, an announcement of sorts for you, right? Like your, your talk was mm -hmm. recently just shared. So yep. do you want to let everybody know what your talk is called, what it's going to be about? Yeah, yeah. So my talk is uh, called um, uh, RxJS Operators. Uh, or, I'm sorry, I, I haven't slept much. I have a new baby. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, so my talk is, is basically about refactoring RxJS Operators. So um, so custom RxJS, RxJS Operators are standing by back now. Um, so it's basically about you know, when you sometimes open up a component and you see a, a a pipe that has a bunch of operators and you're like, I have to sit here for a few minutes, kind of figure out what is it doing? What's the final result that it's passing back to the template and how we can refactor that to be a lot more readable and in the theme of tonight, more testable. Um, and it's kind of themed to an infomercial. Um, so just kind of going on that play of like these horrible problems that you can only solve with this one thing that you can get for like, Normally a hundred dollars, but now it's nineteen dollars, right? Nice. Um, so it's gonna be fun. I'm gonna have some fun videos and memes, and just uh, just gonna have fun with it, really. Yeah, yeah. And the cool thing about yours, though, and this is, I think, a bit of an announcement. I don't, I don't know that the news has really spread that. Yes, the conference itself is June 14 and 15, and we've all already known about the workshops that are on the 12th and the 13th, but they've just announced. I think or not. I don't know. Maybe I'm I'm telling you early, but um the night of Wednesday, so the night before the actual conference starts, there's going to be like a bonus track. And they've just released a few talks that will be part of that. And I'm sure they're going to have different entertainment and things going on as well. But that's what Chris will be doing. So Chris, you really get to pretty much start NGConf off, right? Your talk is going to be the lead getting into all the excitement and the fun. So I'm excited to, to see the presentation. And then Alisa, let's hear about yours. What's your talk all about? I know you came up with a clever kind of superhero-y talk, right? Yes. So my talk is called um, Introducing the Identity Guardians, Auth Tokens in a Flash. And it is going to cover um, authentication, authorization, and the access tokens you get and how they work within your Angular application. I'm excited. So are you going to do a kind of a superhero theme with it or focus more on the content? I am planning on doing a superhero and of course comic theme. Okay. To nice. It. So yeah, I need to make I'm sure excited. that the content is also good and then not just leaning in all into the comics, but that's a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah. 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 That's exciting. So let me ask you both this and then I'll, I'll share as well, but when you've been to NGConf in the past, what are some things that you've enjoyed? And this, you could answer this two ways because we have had NGConf online, but we've also all been in Salt Lake. So is there something that you've really enjoyed either doing downtown Salt Lake that you would like other people, you know, hey, go do this. I really suggest you go do this. Or alternatively, is there something that you found online that you would think that online attendees could really benefit as well, benefit from as well. Well, I don't live in Salt Lake City, so the only times I go is for um, NGConf. So I will say as a um, somebody who's just visiting for a little bit, um, I thought that the way they had the Discord uh, chat set up last year was really helpful and it added a a way for people to have the online communication and to get to know each other, as well as opportunities for people to, to meet in person, right? So um, if you are in person, then check out those uh, 
ways where people are collaborating, really is a collaboration, to figure out where we're going to eat or where we're going to go and um, hang out afterwards and just join a group. I don't know if there's like a place um, that I would recommend um, because it was always fun to be with the company of others, you know, at that at that place. Although that Thai restaurant close by was pretty good, <laughs> I will say. <laughs> and um, if you are online only, I'm sure there's going to be that sort of the same sort of chat experience. I know there was when I did the, uh, when I joined, you know, during pandemic. Um, so yeah, just really meet people. That's really a great opportunity to do so. Definitely. And if you are in person, do the karaoke if they have it, because it's fun. Yeah. I think Narwhal always hosts that, right? Yeah. Chris, what about you? Um, yeah. So I've only been to Salt Lake twice. One was many years ago on my way to Yellowstone and definitely recommend Yellowstone, but it's not <laughs> that close to Salt Lake City. Yes. So <laughs> you, you need a few days for that. Um, but yeah, last year um, I ended up walking to the Mormon Mormon temple with a coworker and there was an organist there practicing for a concert and, you know, they're very welcoming. You can go and see the property and it's um, just a really beautiful property. Um, you can't go in all the temples, but some of the smaller ones, like where the organist is playing, um, it's pretty cool just to hear the acoustics and and the musicianship. And um, so I just really liked kind of walking around um, downtown. It, it doesn't feel like a big, busy city, like like a New York would or something like right. that. It's, it's very more, it's very open. There's just a lot of mountain views, um, just a nice area to just walk and kind of clear your head, get away from the tech for a little while and just get some fresh yeah. air. Yeah. See, now I am the Utah native. I'm, I am Utah through and through. But I'm I'm also excited. This will be my first ever conference that I've spoken at. And I'm really excited because it's definitely a spoof. Uh, it'll be a bit of a skit. But the whole idea is that if anybody's ever seen the Big Bang Theory and you're familiar with Sheldon Cooper, who does his fun with flags, uh, I guess, vlog. And he and Amy get on and they share all about flags. But I was watching the show one day and I had been at work earlier working with some feature flags. And so the thought came to me, well, what if I did a skit on fun with feature flags? So that is my talk. That's my presentation. It will be all about feature flags, but done through the scope of Sheldon Cooper and his blog. So I'm excited. I think it'll be really fun. Um, from a Utah's perspective, what are some things that you could do while you're downtown? Definitely the restaurants. I think Utah is underestimated for its, its foodie scene. We have a lot of great restaurants. There's a mall downtown called City Creek that I highly recommend. If you're not really into shopping, if for nothing else, they just have great casual food and, and fun restaurants there. But if you have a car or if you want to get in an Uber at all and you're willing to go outside of the Salt Lake area, I really recommend Park City. Getting up, if you really want to see the, the mountains and getting, you know, like Chris said, get some fresh air. Park City really is fantastic. They have all sorts of old Olympic things from when the Olympics were here in 2002. But there's this thing called the Alpine Slide, which is a lot of fun. So there's so many things to do up there. So that's one of the things I would really recommend doing. And yeah, you know, Elisa, I can't agree with you more. Go, go meet up with some people, even if you've never hung out with them before. I know there were several groups that got together just on the fly and everybody went out and they went on hikes. They uh, just went casually to the planetarium is really close. That's a fun place to go hang out. They have some really cool laser shows on the dome theater. So there's, there's really a lot to do, but if anybody ever needs ideas, you can always message me. Uh, Jason, also one of our organizers, Preston, is from Utah, so we'd be happy to share ideas, but definitely excited. And then just a reminder, everybody, if you're a member of our meetup, you get a discount to NGConf. So I'm going to have my co-organizers put this in the chat, but if you are in North America, uh, not counting Mexico, but like Canada, U.S., and you want to go, you, and this is either online or in person, you can get a 10% discount with the code meetup. So just go to ngconf.org, put in meetup when you're ready to buy your tickets, 10% off. 
If you are in Latin America and you want to go to the online uh, conference, then this is kind of long, but and it's not hard to defer or not hard to remember. It's Spanish Meetup Online, and that will give you fifty percent off. That's half off, so that's awesome. And then if you're from Latin America and you want to come in person, put in the code Spanish Meetup, and that's thirty percent off. So we'll put that in the chat. Make sure everybody has that. But yeah, just a little bit of a preview for what's to come. Lots of more exciting news, I'm sure, has not been announced. So we'll look forward to that. But again, the conference is the workshops are the 12th and 13th of June. And then 14 and 15 are the actual conference days. And the event is taking place not at the Grand America this year, but it's at the Little America, literally just across the street. So not far. But OK, then, Elisa, you ready for your talk? Yes. OK, and I know Chris has some some questions for you that we can get to know you a little bit better. Yeah, so uh, Elisa, uh, you are a senior developer advocate for Okta. Uh, full stack developer, community builder, you love learning. Um, you're also an Angular GDE, uh, women, tech make, women tech maker ambassador. You co organize Angular Kansas City meetup, uh, core team of NG Girls. Uh, you also lead another organization that teaches women web development basics. Um, I don't know how you have all the time. <laughs> So what what keeps you motivated to uh, to volunteer so much and and just keeps you keeps you going with all that going on? Yeah, well, part of it is um, I really enjoy the Angular community, so all my Angular activities uh, there is that. I also have really great um, you know core organizers and other core team members, and so it's a it's a group right that uh, works together. So I think that's really about you know the most of it. I have I'm really passionate about making tech accessible to all, which is how I first got involved with uh, um, giving back in the community through um, through helping women learn um, web development uh, skills. So yeah, that's uh, it. Really, it it's my passion. It it fuels me. Well, that's so awesome. I mean, it's so glad that we have people like you to do those things and uh, really make it more accessible. Um. And my other question for you, are you originally from Missouri area? I am not originally from Missouri area. Yeah, I actually grew up in Japan. Okay, wow, that's that's awesome. Um, so now that you live in Missouri, are you a Chiefs fan after this recent Super Bowl? Well, I think that if I said I wasn't, there'd be a lot of judgment <laughs> from <laughs> everybody. So um, the answer is not really. <laughs> I mean, I. The Chiefs are fine. We we love the Chiefs at this in this household um, for sure. I myself am just not a huge football fan, but the Chiefs are fine. Gotcha. Well, I was rooting for. I Chiefs am this a year. fan of other things. <laughs> all Kansas City though, so Kansas City barbecue, huge thumbs up. Kansas City, um, there's a different Kansas City like liquors and stuff. Huge thumbs up. Well, which which liquor is your favorite? If you got to choose. In Kansas City, I'd say the Rieger. The Rieger whiskey is really, really nice. Okay. I'll have to pick some up then. Um, well, I'll let you uh, get to your talk. Looking forward to it. All right. Let's see if I can figure out how to share on Zoom. I haven't, I haven't mastered the skill yet. I think this is it. Okay. All right, is that showing my screen properly? I hope so. Oh, yes, sorry, it, it yeah. is showing. Okay, thank you. But so since I didn't hear anything, I'm gonna just go for it. All right, so tonight we're gonna talk about using test harnesses to test Angular components and how this is gonna help you win. This might be a familiar tale for you. Let's say that you're a fan of K-dramas and you work on a K-drama fan site. On this fan site, you can navigate to an individual K-drama to add comments. Now, this commenting system is pretty standard as far as commenting systems go, meaning that when you add a comment, a submit button enables. But when you think about testing this, it could start to feel really 
overwhelming because not only do you have to worry about how to test components within Angular, but you also have to worry about the testing framework that you're using and any of the intricacies involved there, as well as since these are UI elements that you're interacting with, you have to worry about the HTML API and how you work with those individual elements. All in all, it can be pretty frustrating and really daunting. And if I had to describe automated UI testing in one word, I'd call it fussy. So let's make this a better process. I'm Elisa Duncan. I'm a senior developer advocate at Okta and Angular GDE, and unsurprisingly, a K-Drama fan. You can find me on assorted social channels as Elisa Duncan. Now, first, let's talk about exactly what we're talking about tonight, because there's not a lot of standardization around the language of testing. So what we're gonna focus on are tests that test the UI interactivity within an Angular application using a unit testing library and not just unit testing, but karma to boot. And the reason we're gonna stick with unit testing and karma is because that's what we get out of the box from scaffolding an Angular app. And we don't wanna bring in any sort of other dependencies into this conversation. We wanna focus on the value of using test harnesses. And because we're gonna be talking about the values of using test harnesses within tests, I'll have an expectation that you have written unit tests in Angular before, meaning that you've set up a test bed, that you've interacted with the components on that or the elements on that component, and that you've asserted on them. So just at that level, we'll get this really high level and focus on the value of the harnesses. Now I've used the word harness at least a few times and never explained what that is. So a test harness encapsulates the implementation details of HTML fragments into an API for the sole purposes of testing. So this is a pretty cool concept when you think about this, because we're taking an object-oriented programming concept of encapsulation, bringing it into the front end, and bringing it into testing to boot, which is pretty darn awesome. And when we do this, we, have, we encapsulate HTML fragments. In our world, that's components, right? Because we components make up little HTML fragments that we make into a view. So we're able to encapsulate components and have an API that we could use to work with it during testing mostly so that we don't have to deal with that HTML API, which if we're gonna assign blame to the fussiness, that, that HTML API might take the lion's share. When we use test harnesses, it allows us to ignore the inner workings of these, these encapsulated components, which is the value of having encapsulation in the first place. As a result, we'll have tests that are easier to read and write with less maintenance. Now at this point, we're already winning with our automated tests, right? Who doesn't wanna have tests that are easier to read and write with less maintenance? So this is really awesome. And if you use Angular Material in your application, you have a head start because all Angular Material components have a test harness around each one of their controls and it's available starting in Angular B12. So if you're using Angular B12 or higher and using Angular Material, you'll want to use test harnesses in your tests especially because the new MDC changes that came out in Angular B15 means that your old tests might need updates. So as you are updating your tests to work for, um, for the B15 changes, you might as well upgrade them to also use test harnesses. So let's see what test harnesses look like in action within the scope of a test so that we can see what we're talking about here. We go back to our K-Drama fan site. This time we're gonna log in and navigate to profile settings, which has a newsletter sign up. Now this controls, these two controls are written using Angular material components. And we have an input for the email and we have this fancy on off switch to subscribe. If we look at the component template. What we see are the two elements. One is an input. Oh, and we're using Angular material here. So if you haven't used Angular material before, Everything has a map prefix to it. Otherwise, it should be named pretty similarly to what you expect. So we have a mat input, and we have that fancy on-off switch, which is called a mat slide toggle. Let's try interacting with that input element without any harnesses. So in the traditional way, it might look like this. You'll first want to query for a CSS selector, such as input. Once you have that input element, you'll want to set the, uh, uh, the email value to it. But to do so, you have to access the HTML API, which is available through the native element property. And that gives you access to the HTML API's value property. And then you also have to dispatch an input event, which is required by the HTML API to register the value within the control. 
Now we have to work within Angular constraints, and that is to run change detection so that we are picking up this change. And we wait for the fixture to stabilize before we can continue on with our tests. If you use a uh, hardness instead, it could look like this, which is going to look a lot different. We'll work with the harness around the control, such as a MAT input harness, which is the test harness around the MAT input control. Now, don't worry about the syntax for that loader to get harness part. We'll talk about what that is here in a little bit. But once we have that MAT input harness, which is that test harness around the MAT input control, we can use the API methods that it has available to set the email value. And that's all we have to do. So notice that it was a lot shorter, a lot easier to read and write, and we didn't have to deal with the change detection. And if you have to identify selectors in using a third-party library, you know that they could be kind of painful at times. Let's talk about that MAT slide toggle. You might interact with it by querying for the selector MAT slide toggle. Unfortunately, that's not the interactive element of this control. Under the covers, it's a highly stylized checkbox, and that's what you'd have to interact with in order to change the value on it. But you wouldn't know that it's a highly stylized checkbox without digging into the implementation of this or by inspecting in dev tools, neither of which you should have to do for the scope of a test. And perhaps the underlying foundation of this control, the checkbox, wouldn't change over time. But what if you had to rely on a CSS class name? Because sometimes we do have to do that within our tests. And that's not immutable, right? It could change. As a matter of fact, it's part of what did change with the MDC changes. So now your tests are brittle and can break. On the other hand, when you use a test harness for the selector, it's much more straightforward because you just ask for the harness you want to work with. So when we use test harnesses within the scope of our tests, we're able to have tests that are easier to read and write, have more stability and resiliency, less prone to breakage, which allows us to focus on testing the behaviors that matter to us. And so this is definitely what we want for writing winning tests. The CDK testing API is what provides the underlying foundation for writing tests with harnesses. And it's what supports testing interactions with components. First, we'll start with setting up the test bed, which we skipped earlier. In the test bed, we set up the harness loader, which will be used to get harnesses. We can set a, create a harness loader by creating the component fixture and then passing in that component fixture into the static method testbed harness environment.loader. Now that testbed harness environment.loader is unique per environment, meaning that in this case, it supports unit testing with Karma, which is fine in our case. But I uh, just want to call that out that if you are wanting to use test harnesses for other systems, you can also, you'll have to make this change um, to not use a test harness environment and instead use a different instance of a harness environment. Once you have the harness loader, you have different ways that you can get harnesses and um, you can also create a child loader to get harnesses as well if you want to focus your search within a subsection of the component. Let's say that you have a nav section within your component that has a whole bunch of lists, for example, where you can create a, a child loader just to focus a search within that uh, nav section. I'll walk through each one of these methods in more detail. You can get an individual harness of uh, the type you're asking for by calling loader.getHarness. This will return the, the, mat, the first mat input harness that comes across in the template, or it's going to reject the promise. You can also call get harness or null to return null instead of rejecting the promise. And you can also get a list of all harnesses of a particular type through the method get all harnesses. And that child loader, you can pass in a selector to, to the get child loader method, which is a, class, a CSS class name or nav. And then from there, you can get harnesses like we talked about earlier. You can also filter for a harness, which is really helpful in cases where we go back to that section with the, uh, the nav section with all those lists. Let's say you just want to get the, um, I'm saying lists and I mean links, um, where if you want to get just the profile link within the nav section. What you will do is pass in options to help filter your search. And those options depend on the harness that you are using which makes sense because the way you'd filter for a button wouldn't match the same way that you'd be filtering for an input, for example. 
So if we take a look at the MAT input harness filters, we see that it supports filtering by value and by placeholder, and you can pass in a string or regex. So if we take a look at what this looks like in practice, we can pass in the options to filter our uh, search for MAT input harnesses with the value only cool comments, please, as an example. So once you have a harness though, it is up to the API of that harness and any subsequent interactions you can take. Once, once again, it makes sense because the way you'd interact with a button wouldn't match the way you work with a input, for example. But while we're looking at code examples in here so we can demystify things, don't worry, this is all documented. You do not have to dig around in the internal implementation. You can find the, uh, the API for each one of these test harnesses, as well as all the options for filtering um, when you look up the control that you want to use on, on material.angular.io, there, it's all documented for you. But we are going to take a peek under the covers. So if we take a look at the MAT input harness, for example, we see that it has methods such as is disabled or is required, which is something you might expect from HTML elements, as well as methods such as get value, get name, and set value that is specific for an input control. And it also extends from the base class component harness. That base class component harness has a static, has a method post that returns the root element for this test harness. So it's something similar to that uh, native element property that we had earlier with the returning the HTML uh, element. But it's better than returning just the HTML element because it returns a test element, which is an interface and it has standardization on how we could work with that element. So it's got methods like blur, clear, click, and, and others like set property, um, set input value, things like that. But notice that everything that we're working with so far is a sync. And that's so that we have the latest state on the control and that it handles a change detection for us. Because we're working with so many asynchronous methods, the CDK library has a handy helper method called parallel that we could use. And so it acts like a promise resolve plus handles change detection for us. And in one swoop, we can make multiple asynchronous calls and work with the output. All right, so with this, you are now winning with writing tests using Angular Material Component test harnesses but we can win even more and we can really leverage the power of the CDK testing library and write test harnesses around our custom components within our own applications for maximum winning. Now you wanna write test harnesses around your shared components so that other consumers of your shared component, it makes it easier for them to write tests. And let's see what this looks like in action with a really minimal example. We go back to our KDrama fan site this time we can go to the commenting capabilities. Now this commenting component is written using just straight HTML elements. We're not bringing in any third party libraries here just so we can see what this looks like from the base level. And to really streamline things tonight, we're just gonna only focus on the input control, but you can certainly extend what we're gonna talk about to other elements on your component as well. That shared component code snippet looks like this. We have the selector, app add comment, and that will be important here in a little bit. And in our template, we have that input control. That's what we're gonna focus on. To start, we're going to define the filters to support querying. So we're gonna create an interface, call it add comment harness filter and extend from the base harness filters. We're gonna follow the same naming patterns that Angular Material uses. And then when we think about how we'd filter for this, this uh, component, it probably makes sense to query by comment, and that is a string. And there's probably, it makes sense to query for other things as well, but we're going to just focus on this one. Next, to implement the test harness for your custom component, you'll create a class such as add comment harness, uh, once again, following the naming pattern that AM Material has, and extend from the base class component harness. Now we need to define a host selector. Now this host selector should match the component for which we are writing this test harness for. And in our case, that's app add comment. Next, we wanna be able to get the elements that's in our components, such as that input. 
So we're going to use the base classes locator for method and pass in a, a selector. Now this returns that test element, which is like the HTML API, but it's not going to return the, H the uh, test element directly. It's going to return a function that returns the test element. And that's how though, that's so that we always have that latest state on this control. Next, let's think about the API methods we want to support. For a commenting component, we'll probably want to get a comment. So to implement this get comment method, we're going to want to get that input control and then work with the test elements methods to get the value property. It definitely makes sense to have more uh, API methods than just get comment, but we're going to focus on this one just for now. Next, to handle our filtering capabilities, we're going to import our uh, filters that we created earlier and then create a static method with. Now, this static method should return a harness predicate. So we're going to implement a new, create a new pre uh, harness predicate and then add our option for filtering, which is comment, and then implement that predicate by doing a string match. Now with this, our implementation for our test or custom component test harness is complete, but there is one more step. We want to test that test harness that we just created. And this is because we want to treat our test harness like it's an API, right? Because other, we're going to have consumers on this, other people will be relying on it. So we want to make sure that we keep it nice and stable and working right. In order to test your custom component test harness, you're going to follow this pattern called using a test host. Now, unfortunately, I don't have time to walk through how to do that here. But at a high level, what you're going to do is create a component, a host component within the scope of your test. And then in, within your uh, that host component, you will bring in the app add comment component in that template. And then once you have the app add comment in that template, you can now write tests against that, uh, uh, that host component and use your uh, test harness that you created. I do have an example of how this works in my uh, GitHub project for this, uh, and I will be sharing that link here afterwards so you can see what this looks like. In our example, we just had that one input control, so there wasn't a lot of complexity. However, those component harness locator methods can scale to whatever complexity your component requires. So that locator for method, there's also locator for all to return all uh, elements of a particular selector. And you can also return locator for optional, which will return optional elements within your component as well. And the selectors are not just limited to using CSS selectors. You can also pass in other test harnesses as your selector, which allows you to really grow your, your uh, uh, test harness as large as it needs to be and be able to create a compositions of other components, which is particularly useful if you want to write a test harness for much larger HTML fragments, you know, such as our views that you might be using in EDE tests. But just remember, just because you can have that level of complexity in your test harness doesn't mean you should, right? When writing components, small is winning. Not only is writing small components the best design practice, but it also makes it easier for you to write tests for and to write test harnesses for. But we have some recipes for success. You want to use test harnesses to keep UI testing cleaner and easier to maintain. And use test harnesses anytime you're testing with Angular material components because they're already there, so you might as well take advantage of them, especially before those MDC changes. And you want to write test harnesses for any shared components that you have, which make it easier for testing your own application. But don't forget to test those test harnesses and treat it like an API. You can check out my code on GitHub. I have this, uh, this entire project with and without tests, uh, with and without harnesses. And so you can also see that and the uh, implementation of that custom component test harness and the testing for that as well. My slides are also available online and I have a multi-series post about using test harnesses if you wanna read some more and dive in deeper. And uh, feel free to reach out to me at Elisa Duncan. Uh, if you have any questions, you wanna chat about test harnesses or unit testing or, um, especially if you have any suggestions for K-dramas to watch, I'm definitely open to that. Or if you just want to chat about whatever's exciting and you know new for you, 
So for example, I recently purchased a uh, YubiKey and I'm really excited about try, you know, playing with that and checking it out. So if you have a YubiKey, I'm definitely interested in, in uh, chatting with you about that as well. So that's it. All right, thank you so much. Yeah, amazing. Thanks a ton, Alisa. It, it was oh, a fantastic you. talk. Really, really, really great. And we got some excellent questions. Uh, please ask your questions in the Q&A. Uh, we'll start off with Steve Whitman. Um, I'm trying to grasp the similarities and the differences between testing components with test harnesses and unit tests compared to testing components with Cypress. Are they, are they interchangeable or do they have certain situations where they shine? Should I know both? Uh, any thoughts? Well, I will be honest. I have not tried using the Cypress uh, component testing yet. So maybe this is something that uh, um, would be a great like discussion point to have in the, in the chat. You know, I'd love to hear what other people think, think as well. For sure, definitely. Definitely. Um, I, I guess there's no, no magic formula, but, but uh, I, I'm sure there are many people with uh, different experiences who, who probably got many uh, things to share. So yeah, for sure. And actually, uh, that, that brings up a really good point, uh, Marcus. Anytime I think we're talking about testing and we're starting to getting into those how conversations, I think we're already at a really awesome place, right? Because that means you understand the why and um, now we're discussing like, how to really optimize. And so this is, right. this is a place where there's not one ever great, like singular answer. Um, yeah, and it might also both. depends. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, definitely, definitely, for sure. Uh, let's see, Chris, uh, you, 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 you found any, any? Yeah, yeah, there's some good questions in here. Um, so Blair Lairvin asked, um, is there a way to get a specific element if there are multiple on the page that doesn't have a, a width filter option for it, such as finding a button with a specific CSS class on a page with multiple buttons? So when you use the test harnesses, we shouldn't be searching for the CSS class. And I don't believe that that would be exposed um, unless, the, unless the authors of that component intend on making that an actual like, immutable property, right? Because it could change out from under them. So I don't think that you wouldn't see that from Angular Material, for example. It's very possible that you might see that in other libraries that are expecting to keep that as, a, um, as an API, but um, I'm not aware of any. All right, thank you. Uh, Marcus, do you want to, we have one yeah. more left in the Q&A? Yes, we, we got one right here. So Ben uh, asks, can harnesses be used to test the component they are written for? Um, that is using like a app component harness to test uh, and the app compo comment component. I'm so sorry. Uh, that is using app co comment harness uh, to test app comment component, I read that wrong. Um, or are they only for testing components that consume the harnessed components? And that is uh, using app comment uh, harness in tests for like a comment list component, for example. Does that make sense? I think so. It, so if you, I have a test harness written for my um, app comment component, then I could test the, uh, the app comment component through my test harness by um, using a, that host uh, component, the host, uh, um, the test host pattern. My goodness, it's getting late for me. So using that, uh, that test host um, pattern. So this is where you would create that host component within the scope of your test. And then you'd be bringing in the, in this case, app comment component into that host component and then using the test harness to, um, to write tests for it and to test against it. That, does that answer your question? I, I hope I got that, uh, um, that ordering correct. 
And then we had uh, no, one yeah, last question. Yeah, great, from, great answer. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, we had one last question sorry from uh, yeah. Waza. They asked, are we limited to using harnesses with material only? So I'm guessing they're asking, can you use it with other libraries? Could you write your own harnesses? Yes, and the answer is absolutely you are not limited. Um, you can um, definitely material has test harnesses available for all of its controls, and you could write your own custom one, which I'm recommending that you do as a best practice for any place where it makes sense, right? I'm not saying write a test harness for every single component within your own system. Like that's that's at some like level of uh, um, extreme that perhaps is is not a great idea. But any place where you have any shared components or any place where it makes sense to write a test harness in the scope for an EDE test, for example, you should definitely write that and then you can consume it. There, if you are a UI library author, um, you should have test harnesses that would make it easier for consumers to also use. And I'm sure that there are um, other UI libraries out there other than material that have test harnesses for them. Great. Right. Well, thank you so much. We really appreciate you coming on and, and sharing with us. Yeah, you're very welcome. Well, I always love when Elisa is is with us. She's such a sweetheart and always such a good presenter. So thank you, Elisa, for coming.